Thank you for a very interesting lecture. So I will be much more clinical and basic, if I may say so, uh, just showing uh, for those of you who are not ophthalmologists, which is everybody here except Professor Tomita. <laughs> so it's very simple. Uh, you already alluded to, I, I think I have to direct this maybe closer. Oops. Yeah. So what we know is that diabetic retinopathy is caused by glue. Oops. I must have pushed something that I should not. Whoa. Am I doing something wrong? <laughs> okay, excellent. Now, if you divide microvascular and macrovascular uh, comorbidities, you will find the kidney on both sides, probably the brain would be on both sides, and at the extreme end you will have retinopathy, which is purely hyperglycemic, and a coronary artery disease, which is uh, more macrovascular, as you all know. The problem is that not every patient will develop nephropathy, even at high glucose, it's only about one out of three, and somehow they are protected irrespective. And if you remember, diabetes itself is defined by a certain cutoff level of glucose above which retinopathy will develop. So we dis describe diabetes as a cutoff above which retinopathy, mostly microvascular disease, will develop. It's important to keep that in mind because the confounding factor is that Cardiometabolic risk factors, including atrogenic dyslipidemia, they tend to accelerate beta cell failure, which then leads to worse glycemic control because those patients lose their residual beta cell functions quicker and poorer glycemic control. So it's mostly a confounder and also a driver. The relationship between high glucose and macrovascular disease which is considered de facto a fact by cardiologists is not as such and is mostly driven by a CKD. So the whole thing is rather confused given the fact that the cardiometabolic risk factors tend to accelerate macrovascular disease. So the whole epidemiology is tend to be confused and the average cardiologist is getting uh, a bit lost in that as we are all. <laughs> and normally I should have the next slide. Yeah. I can go quicker here because Professor Tomita has already alluded to many of those things when I say getting quicker. That's important is that type 2 diabetic retinopathy may not be at all identical to type 1 retinopathy even if some conditions can be shared but maculopathy is more typical of type 2 uh, diabetic retinopathy whereas proliferative, pre-proliferative retinopathy may be more uh, relevant for type 1 diabetes but given the sheer amount of type 2 diabetics, the majority of uh, visual loss will be found in type 2 diabetes and of course the residual risk will be higher. So um, it's an asymptomatic disease until late, that's the issue. And as I told you before this morning, we don't have a, a risk calculator for uh, microvascular disease. I'm supposed to have the next slide here, but I don't desperate. <laughs> so I will move quicker here. <coughs> Well, uh, I intend to move quicker, but, uh, <laughs> oops, yeah. And the Brownlee hypothesis, for those of you who know it, was published almost 20 years ago by uh, Michael Brownlee in Nature. And it just describes, and not many other diabetologists even know what happens, but you have four different pathways of hyperglycemia-induced complications. And if you look at them, they all start with uh, entry of glucose into cells where the entry is not regulated by a control system such as the, the, the adipose tissue or the muscle. So you will never have diabetic complications in tissues where glucose can not enter freely. But if the glucose can enter freely, then you will have uh, complications developing over time. It's a very complicated thing and there is a very um, scarcity of risk factors that were identified and most of them are overlapping meaning poor metabolic control is equivalent to longer duration of diabetes especially uh, because you accumulate glucose over time it's an area of a risk factor glucose is a perfect risk factor for retinopathy just as LDL cholesterol is a perfect risk factor the higher the worse the lower the better blah blah and uh, type 1 will have more retinopathy than type 2 because they become diabetic at a younger age and they are exposed to a longer duration of high glucose. 
and uh, that's where we are from. All the rest is controversial. So what I decided to do is just to show you my own patients. Uh, this is supposed to be my hospital, uh, but because of COVID, under this building has been constructed. <laughs> So, but we are officially supposed to use that slide as a background, so it's a, it's a fake background. Uh, the other hospital is just a derelict place. But Belgium is, used to be an affluent country where diabetes care is free. Patients don't pay a, a, a cent for their diabetes care. And despite that, they have very poor results, as I will show you on the next slide. So these are my own patients, so uh, I can only blame myself about one third of patients have a diabetic retinopathy, which is split into slightly more than one fifth of type two diabetics have a diabetic retinopathy, and maculopathy will be found here mostly, and more than half of type one diabetics have a retinopathy already. So this is the most prevalent comorbidity of type one diabetics uh, given is the diabetic retinopathy. That makes sense because diabetes is defined by a cutoff of glucose above which retinopathy develops. So what I did was just to look and to sift through risk factors and what I did was to make a case control uh, for type 1 and type 2 but adjusted for diabetes duration. If you do that, you cancel out any difference in age, in gender, in glucose exposure. So that could just, you know, sieve out some potential uh, that's a univariate analysis, but it shows interesting things that there's a significant association with smoking. These are type 1 diabetics. The problem is that the risk factors that I could find out, or the risk markers, are not at all the same versus type 2 diabetes. So just keep that in mind. It could be very different conditions. Having a metabolic syndrome, so uh, that's defined without taking into account the glucose factor because that was designed for type 2. So having a metabolic syndrome is definitely associated, high blood pressure, that's not new. Having a lower C-peptide level, that's probably a marker of poor glycemic control. Being on Haze inhibitor, that's probably because they have retinopathy. More of them are on lipid-lowering drugs, and that's interesting because you will see later, they have a lot more prevalence of, of macrovascular disease, despite having the same age and the same gender. And being on fibrate, this is off-label use, by myself, so I must confess that I use fibrates a lot in type 1 diabetes, even there is no evidence that it works, but there is no evidence that it would not work. <laughs> so that's what I do. They have a lower GFR and some oddity. Interestingly for you here, they have a higher level of lipoprotein A, and it was measured systematically in all patients in, in my hospital, in all diabetic patients, to say that. Now, what was not uh, found was an association with microalbuminuria. That's what I was telling previously. A lot of patients are naturally protected from CKD, even if they have high glucose. What was significantly associated was neuropathy. I just look at some non-vascular complications of high glucose, such as cataract, shoulder capsulitis, and what I did not expect was to have such an association with macroangiopathy, but not with cerebrovascular disease. Sorry, Pierre, for that. But these are type 1 diabetics, of course. So what was puzzling to me was the association with macrovascular disease, which was not de facto expected. What about type 2? And I will end up with that if I can get the next slide. Yeah. So type 2, again, it's a case control uh, adjusted for diabetes duration, which erased the effect of age and gender. Nothing. So it's very different from type 1 diabetes. Metabolic syndrome is not different. I look at hepatic steatosis because there are very puzzling data that we found. If you have fatty liver, you have much less retinopathy in cross-section. But if you are just for atherogenic it's the atherogenic which will drive the risk for retinopathy, not the fatty liver. So that's very puzzling. And if you go further, Drugs that improve fatty liver that we use massively, such as GLP-1 receptor agonists, they tend to raise the risk of retinopathy. So there is something that needs to be addressed there. Uh, I, I would like to have your opinion later. Anyway, all these were not associated in univariate analysis uh, in type 2 diabetes, 
there was nothing on the lipid side, but it could have been blood by a much higher use of fibrates in those patients. And what I found to be significantly associated, again, these patients have been adjusted for diabetes duration, is BMI, waist, high blood pressure that was expected. There was a slight association with HbA1c, but 0.2% is unlikely to ascribe for all of their retinopathy. We found indices of accelerated loss of beta cell function, which could be a marker for worse metabolic control, but this doesn't count here because their overall exposure to glucose is identical and what we found a uh, much higher use of fibrates as expected. So this is just a snapshot that I wanted to share with you to show you that probably we are nowhere in defining additional risk factors to the one which has already been described. And there is ample room for improvement. And as I repeat it, we need a risk calculator for microvascular disease that would take into account the risks for not only retinopathy, but maculopathy a risk calculator that would be segregating type 1 from type 2 and ideally if we could identify those patients who will never have CKD due to diabetes or high glucose then we could stop checking urine in those patients that will that would save a lot of time and money thank you very much